everyone and welcome. My name is Tal and I'm a student for Politics and Government and European Studies and I'm here with you today as a representative for the Simo Simone Vale Research Center for Contemporary European Studies. I am happy to welcome you to the Symposium on History, Memory and Forgetting. I am honored to call upon the Rector of the University, Professor Chaim Hames, to offer words of greetings. There's still empty seats, so uh, come on in. Good evening, everyone, and uh, happy uh, uh, Hanukkah. It is uh, an incredible pleasure to be here uh, this evening together with such uh, uh, august uh, uh, company. First of all, uh, Professor uh, Peter Burke from Cambridge and Professor Roy Foster uh, from uh, uh, Oxford. As I said uh, just before to uh, Professor Burke, I, I said you probably don't remember me, but I remember very well sitting in uh, some of your lectures uh, in Cambridge when I was there as a, uh, a student. And it's a great, and it's a great honor to have him uh, uh, here uh, with us. Um, it's often, t often it's said that it's difficult to bring Oxford and Cambridge together, but uh, uh, it's great for us that we have uh, uh, both representatives of Oxford and uh, uh, Cambridge here to talk about a book written by a colleague of ours from the history, from the history department, uh, uh, Guy Biner. And Guy, congratulations on a seriously magisterial uh, uh, book which I uh, had the pleasure of I was given a copy a few days ago and I spent the weekend well some of the weekend uh, reading through uh, uh, the book and it's it's amazing to see how much uh, uh, work archival work uh, uh, how much uh, uh, time you must have spent trying to put together and gather the materials that were needed to try and put together the, the coherent picture that you uh, uh, that you did I have no intention of talking about the book because uh, I'm sure that our uh, distinguished guests will do uh, a much better job uh, than I will. I forgot to say when I began, but I would also like to welcome the ambassador of Ireland, uh, Alison uh, Kelly, who's sitting uh, over there. Welcome and thank you very much for coming and uh, joining in this uh, event. In, in the context of uh, this evening, uh, I would I would perhaps like to and after and while reading through the introduction, particularly of uh, uh, the book, it gave rise to thought to me about something that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, to me, I'm the case study in in uh, uh, this case, the case of uh, um, uh, of critical reflection on, on memory and uh, uh, forgetting. And I'll have to give you a little bit, a little bit of uh, uh, background. Right? For those of you who uh, know, I'm one of my fields or fields of interest is Jewish, Christian, Christian Jewish uh, uh, relations. And as uh, most of you probably know, um, Christian Jewish relations over the past 2,000 years have had their ups and downs, mainly, mainly uh, uh, downs, some ups, but also uh, 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 lots of downs. Um, and about 60 years, almost 50-something uh, uh, years ago, at uh, the, at the uh, Second Vatican, the uh, Church re-examined its relationship with the Jews and came out with a document, not just with the Jews, with the other religions in general, and came out with a document, a very famous document called Nostra Aetate, right, in our, in our times, which deals with uh, or tries to re-evaluate the Christian the Christian relationship with the, uh, particularly with the Jewish world, but it also dealt with, it also dealt with some of the other uh, religions. A couple of weeks ago, I received a mail from the Vatican, and in the mail, I was asked whether I would provide a recommendation for someone the Church wants to elevate to sainthood, to canonize. Now, at, at the time, I thought to myself it was rather strange, right, requesting a uh, um, letter of recommendation for sainthood from a Jew, right? And I actually gave it a bit of thought as to whether, as to whether I should uh, uh, um, answer or not. And the, the issue was that they were afraid 
or it had been raised. Right? The point had been raised that perhaps the person that they wanted to elevate to uh, 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 sainthood was an anti-Semite. Now, in, back, in, in brackets, uh, I, I, I actually fact, I thought of replying that if that was one of the criteria for sainthood, then there were many, many saints in the uh, uh, Catholic Church who would have to be, who would have to be uh, decanonized. But I didn't do that. But I did uh, uh, think about uh, uh, whether, whether I should write uh, uh, this letter. And this brings me to, uh, uh, in the end I did. The way I, wrote, I wrote a letter of, uh, well, I'm not sure whether it was a letter of recommendation, but I wrote, I wrote a letter about what I thought about the, uh, the person that was, uh, um, that was to be elevated or will be elevated, I don't know, or might not be elevated as a result of my letter, to uh, uh, sainthood. And reading Guy's book made me think about the question of uh, memory and forgetting. Right. Whose who's memory? What memory are we... Th what the institutional memory of the church? Right? Has Nostra Aetate wiped the institutional uh, memory? And therefore everything... And therefore um, it's, there's no problem right, turning to someone like me to ask me to write a letter for... Uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, this canonization process. On the other hand, what about me as a historian? Right? What, what is my uh, uh, memory okay, of the, uh, both of the uh, research that I've done on this particular person? Right? And was my memory or is my memory even uh, um, connected to the reality of, of what was? What story Am I uh, uh, telling myself about this uh, uh, person? Have I perhaps forgotten? Right? What should have been? What should have been my uh, memory? And perhaps I shouldn't have, or thought twice, or three times, or four times about writing the letter. Right? I think these are all questions that uh, um, Guy raises in a different sense, and I think in a much better way, in his book. And I look forward to hearing what our speakers have to say uh, about this book this evening. So I wish us all a very, very uh, interesting evening, and we should have many such occasions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Haynes. Um, I invite Professor Guy Beiner from the Department of History to introduce our speakers for today. Good afternoon. I, I'm going to have to, before I actually say anything, I'm going to correct the rector. I know it's not correct procedure, but I will say this event is not specifically about the book in question. It's a reflections on forgetting and remembering. The book is somewhere in the background. In fact, I'm the coordinator of the, of the seminar of the Department of History. This is a seminar meeting of the Department of History. As you see, we prefer to have rather grand, grandiose seminars. You should come to our seminar more often. Before I begin with introductions, there's a few words of thanks that need to be said. And though I usually don't use a piece of paper for thanks, I will open to make sure that I mention everybody. But actually, I'm going to turn it around a bit now that I think about it. I have a certain sequence here. Usually when we say thanks, we have a protocol at university. We start with the distinguished guests from abroad, then we move to the upper echelons of the university. We make our way down, what we call in historians, top-down history. But I'm very much for history from below. So I'm going to turn it upside down for a minute and start by giving particular thanks to our moderator here, Tal Bean. And I have to say that because it was a conscious decision that the moderator of this event would not be an entitled professor or a dean or head of a department, but a student. Tal is an excellent student, and she's one of many excellent students that we have at the department and at the Center of European Studies, of Contemporary European Studies. And I think it's great that Tal rose to the challenge and is moderating this event. So thank you very much to Tal. And I should add, in fact, to all of quite a team of students that have helped me put together this event. Bar Mashiach, uh, Sofia Jovner, and the whole team coordinated by Hila Zahavi, Dr. Da Hila Zahavi, who have helped me put this whole event together uh, and have worked around the clock, which is remarkable. Having said that, we'll do a multi-directional, it's a big word in memory now, um, it, saying of thanks, and I will say thanks at this stage to the Ambassador of Ireland, um, Her Excellency, Alison Kelly, and, to, and, of, and of course also the deputy head of the mission, James O'Shea, who's here in the university for the first time. 
Um, Her Excellency Ambassador, Ke uh, Ambassador Kelly has been with us all the time, has supported this university constantly. She comes constantly to events here. In fact, it was at an event a half year or so ago that we met, a bit more, and over at lunch I asked you, is there a chance that you'll support such an event? And immediately you said yes. So it's remarkable how things began moving at that point. I think it was a bit more than half a year ago. And it wouldn't have happened without you. I have to thank the Rector for coming here personally out of a busy schedule, Professor Hames, and has also supported this event. It wouldn't have happened without your help. And also our new de Dean of Humanities, who can't be here today, Professor Amit Schechter, uh, who's also supported this event, and I think that's very important. I mustn't forget that this event is sponsored by the Anna and Sam Lopin Chair of History and the former occupant of the chair, who I do not see here, but I know is here. Where is it, Chen, Professor Chen? Over there, Professor Chen, my former colleague, former occupant of the chair, who's moved on to other pastures. He's now the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Jerusalem. It's a great honor that you're here, Tzik. Also, thank you for making this event possible. I've mentioned the Simon Weil Research Center for European Studies. I should add that Professor René Poznanski, the head of the institute, was unable to come here today because she's giving a keynote lecture at an event also about memory as well, about Vichy, France, at the Hebrew University. So there's always competing events. I'll give a moment for Sharon students to sit down. You're right. There's plenty of chairs. Um, and lastly, we'll hear about them a bit further on. We also have sponsorship for this event by Guinness, but we'll hear about that later on. So we'll, we'll keep the refreshments aside. And, and at this stage, and at this stage, it's my honor to introduce the speakers. I'll introduce them one by one. And I'll also do this in a rather unorthodox fashion, if I may, for the simple reason that if we go through a standard academic introduction, just reading, just listing their main works and commenting on each one briefly would take a good, good amount of time. And also, there's no reason to do that today. You just have to open Wikipedia, open their department page. You'll get all this information. They're both well-known figures, and much is known about them. So what I thought of doing, rather than opting for that foolish cliche that these are people who need no introduction, because there is no such person who needs no introduction, I thought of giving you a very short, personal introduction to each one of them, how I encountered their work. As a student in Tel Aviv University some years ago, I chose to study general history at Tel Aviv University. And as I walked into the department, I discovered a whole new era that I didn't know had existed till then. There was antiquities, and there was modernity, modern history, and those made sense. And in between was the Middle Ages, and those are the classic divisions. But certainly for the first time in Tel Aviv, I encountered the early modern, and I had no idea what that is. So I went. I did what people did then. I think now what people do is simply look at Google. But what you did then is you actually went to the library. People forget that there is such a thing as a library sometimes. I went to the Suraski Library, and I quickly wanted to find out what is this early modern period. I understood that the key to understanding, or the key to coming to terms with the early modern, was to understand the Renaissance. So I looked for the best book available in the Tel Aviv University Library on the Renaissance. And that's where I first met, as a text, Professor Peter Burke. It was through your books on the Renaissance that a whole new period was open for me, was open to me. And history was suddenly open to me. Everything seemed different after I read those books. Peter Burke has been my guide constantly over the two, two and a half decades that have passed since then, constantly directing me, directing me more towards cultural history, I think, and social history, always there to kind of guide. I'd always turn to those books to see where it is. And so in a way, I feel that I've always known you, even though we've met briefly on very short occasions. Towards the end of my degree, I realized, thanks to the influence of Professor Burke, that I would like to research more history of popular culture. And from that, I developed an interest in folklore. A few years later, I had the privilege of being invited as a doctoral student to a conference in the Warburg Institute. I don't know if you remember that, Professor Burke. It was in the Warburg Institute, a conference called Folklore and the Historian. We all presented our papers, and then Professor Burke got up, and he presented a paper on the history of the relationships between folklorists and historians. And suddenly I realized this was not terra incognita. I had been following the path of others. There was a history of relationships, even pinpointed the exact moment that I was standing. It was a moment of rapprochement, of coming together of history and, folk and folklore. So once again, and there's been other occasions, which I won't list here, that I've had the privilege of meeting Professor Burke each time, cluing me in. Some people in this room might remember his, st his stern lectures from three years ago. 
uh, where he gave a series of lectures in Jerusalem on 500 years of history of exiles and exp expatriates, 1500 to 2000. Always changing the way we look at things. But Professor Burke might not know it, there's one reason specifically that he was invited here today. I'd like to remind you. You wrote an article in the late 80s, I think the original uh, article was written, called History as Social Memory. After I read that article, that defined my research agenda till the current day. It changed completely how I look at everything. I'll even quote two lines from it, if I may, because that's been my candle by which I've guided myself. If we use terms like social memory, and on purpose he uses the term social memory and collective memory, and you'll see I'd use the same, completely guided by Peter Burke, we do risk reifying concepts. On the other hand, if we refuse to use such terms, we are in danger of failing to notice the different ways in which the ideas of individuals are influenced by the groups to which they belong. We heard before the rector talking about individual memory and group memory. It all comes together in social memory. The article is fabulous. It preceded the big memory boom. Since then, everybody has become a historian of memory. Peter Burke was there ahead of the pack. But it also had an intriguing line, which wasn't picked, up, picked on by many at the time. It had the following line. This is a very Peter Burke kind of line. He poses a problem, he solves it, and then he leaves you with another problem. It is often illuminating to approach problems from behind, to turn them inside out, to understand the workings of social memory. It, be, it may be worth investigating the social organization of forgetting, the rules of exclusion, suppression or oppression, and the question of who wants whom to forget what and why. In a phrase, social amnesia. This line has haunted me for the past 20 something years. And for that reason, I invited, without telling him explicitly, Peter Burke to explain to us what he means by social amnesia and to do what he does best, to put it in a comparative perspective. Please, Professor Burke. <laughs> 